Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here for the this uh, edition of the uh, Cross Canada Checkup. So the Tuesday night editions we're doing in collaboration with the CPA. So these ones are a little bit different than our other sessions where uh, in these ones you'll be typing in your uh, questions and comments throughout and then I'm going to read them out. So today we have, uh, we're going to be talking about a really amazing initiative that's happening in the Ottawa Valley where a private practice and a hospital are teaming up to kind of reduce the burden on medical systems and seeing how they can come together to support the COVID-19 response. But as uh, our, our sessions normally go, I'm going to pass it over to Mike for a situation report. All right, thank you, Phil, and I am gonna share my screen here. So, um, right, okay, so as usual, we'll go through some of the numbers. Um, just maybe this time we're trying to blend a little bit of the information so that the slides, when they're up, they're maybe on the one hand a little bit densely packed with information, but there may be fewer of them. Uh, a lot of this, uh, the usual people here will see them familiar. Um, uh, when I pulled this together, it was today. Uh, so the numbers globally of affected were, as you can see there, 1.279722. Uh, I just checked a little while ago and it looks like we've uh, crossed the 1.3 uh, level now. So it's, it's moving. Uh, and again, you can see in the last uh, 24 hours, the numbers that have actually been, um, uh, well, the, the, the number that are, are being infected in the last 24 hours. Um, and you can see some of the other regions there. I think, as you all know, um, some th there is a, quite a bit of concern. Uh, if, and uh, maybe a better way to say it is when uh, the virus uh, goes into lower income environments. Um, and by that, I only mean that you know, the infrastructure is much less robust and uh, not robust enough maybe to, to manage and handle this. So. Um, uh, you can see the, the couple different areas, but uh, anyway, nonetheless, you, you get the point there. Here's our picture of Canada right now. Uh, Quebec is still having more uh, higher numbers of uh, affected. Uh, our numbers are uh, 17,063 people up top here. Uh, the most populated uh, provinces uh, are um, now showing the highest numbers. Uh, something that might be interesting over here, in British Columbia, you see that um, it seems like their approach has uh, really uh, had an effect on the number of new cases. So they're talking a little bit about, although it's way too early, that the curve might be starting to plateau, uh, which is of course a good thing. Um, other uh, nations are also witnessing this, uh, Singapore being one of them, South Korea. So it's not time to let off the gas. Uh, but it is time to start looking and seeing, uh, being encouraged by some of the numbers. Uh, however, the picture is uh, changing. Um, so there, there are numbers. Uh, the picture is increasingly becoming clearer with new data. So as of today, uh, under the Centers for Disease Control Prevention, so this is the US CDC, uh, they have started talking about uh, the effect of COVID-19 on children. Um, and they, are, they report some of their data as it, re as it relates over the last few months. And uh, it's it certainly, uh, the trends hold that children, although less likely to uh, be infected or um, acquire the infection, uh, those who have a compromised immune system or long-standing chronic diseases are more likely to get it than their uh, counterparts. So it, it seems to be the trend here in terms of uh, those who are presenting with uh, weaker immune systems or other diagnostic comorbidities uh, present as somewhat more challenging or they, they, they will or have higher likelihood of uh, acquiring the disease. Uh, you know, some other interesting data. This is uh, U.S. Uh, data or projections, I should say. You know, this is the epicenter now globally. There are more people uh, infected here than there were in any other country. So you, you can see sort of, oops, uh, pardon me, the projections here, uh, um, the, 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 the red line is the average, but you can see the estimated range uh, right here of possible deaths over the next month or two. Uh, so the couple of reflections here, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but a couple of reflections. One, when you see 
uh, a, a, a low here and a high here, which is occupying such a large spread, uh, you, you're, you've got a lot of error in your modeling. Um, and I think that is only a reflection of this is a very new uh, type of uh, vector and transmission. It's not clear. So, so we do have a quite a large spike here, but you see the, when you look at the average, it's still pretty significant. And you see that it doesn't really, it starts to, to peak fairly soon and it doesn't really let off in terms of death uh, for about a month. So, so this, um, you know, here in the epicenter, I find myself in North Carolina at the moment. So here in the epicenter, this, these are some seriously concerning uh, data. Even if it's, even if the, the, it's, we don't get to the high, if this was the best case scenario down at the low, we're still talking about pretty apocalyptic type numbers. Um, and so, so there you go. This is some, some interesting things to be, maybe think about. Uh, we're going to be obviously posting this and these are your references at the bottom. Um, Maybe a couple things that are relevant to us in PT is that there are increasingly a lot of uh, reports around those who've recovered. And although it doesn't seem to me at least uh, clear what are some of the uh, protective signs for those who do recover. Um, in other words, what, what makes one person different than the other in terms of severity of the disease. But, but nonetheless, I, I wanted to show you something. This is from The Guardian. And you can see here, learning to breathe again, long road to recovery, uh, from muscle wasting to post-traumatic stress, patients discharged from critical care face tough convalescence. Now, I, th this is obviously a lead up, right, to uh, me trying to sort of underscore the role that we could have. But if you go into that article, here's a couple of the things that you'll, you'll read. And uh, I'll just read it. This is actually coming from um, this one physician, uh, ICU uh, physician. If you end up in an intensive therapy unit, it's a life-changing experience. It carries a huge cost, even if you get better. Our patients wake up, they're so weak, they can't sit unaided, and many can't lift their arms off the bed due to profound weakness. They need to be taught to walk again, breathe again, and have problems with speech and swallowing. So here we go again. This is um, obviously a, a role that rehabilitation comes into play. Um, so, so we, you know, I think one, we've already known this and we've talked about this on this and other channels, types of channels, but we're all the uh, it is, it is only the beginning. And so there is this long road. And so for, for me personally, and I, you know, maybe later we can have a discussion about it, but, um, this is a sign, this is a white sign that says, listen, we got to be involved early on. And uh, if, you, if one waits until uh, a better time to intervene along this trajectory, it oftentimes becomes a much more challenging rehabilitation process, as we all know. So I thought it was very interesting that The Guardian would start quoting physicians who would talk about these things. Now, of course, the article doesn't go on to talk about rehab or anything like that. But nonetheless, th there's, there's our entry point. It's, it's sort of right there for us to uh, go and get. Now, um, I know I do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be setting up uh, next week's uh, talk a little bit here with um, with Sean Cleaver and Matthew Hunt. Uh, but one thing that um, I, I just published this this other editorial around the effect of COVID nineteen and older persons, um, and I came across this because, um, and I'll tell you what this is in a second. But basically, we're 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 about to face a, a massive shortage in North America, as we all know. Um, and to, to manage this shortage, it is as though you are in a emergency disaster situation. And when you are in that situation, you have to make decisions differently. The challenge or the risk a lot of times is these quick decisions that are based on previous models often um, are uh, inequitable. They uh, discriminate and they are built in with lots of different biases. So what White and Low did here is they created a framework for rationing ventilators and critical care beds during the pandemic. And it's fairly accountable, it's fairly transparent around a eight point system judged by the individual physician or team. And it does include likely to be able to get rehab and return home as one of the indicators or one of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the criteria. So, so this is now being used at the University of Pittsburgh. It's also being used in other parts of the United States. 
And while I think there are some flaws in it, it at least becomes very overt around how decisions are going to make, be made around uh, rationing ventilators. And I'll just maybe posit here that um, a person with a disability um, who is right beside somebody else who is uh, non-disabled, um, let me ask you, under most situations, who is going to get the ventilator? And how do those decisions get made? These are the fairly aggressive, abrasive uh, types of decisions that will be made over these next few weeks, sadly. Uh, and we will all come back thinking, oh my gosh, why did this happen? Why did that happen? But in this case here, White and Lowe have created this uh, uh, framework, which um, I'd encourage you, if any of this sounds interesting, to maybe think about. For me personally, it, it reminds me of um, uh, about a decade ago after the earthquake in uh, Haiti. So uh, this is a, an editorial that um, Ofer Marin uh, and his team wrote. Um, or Ofer is uh, head of the emergency response team for the Israeli Defense Forces, who uh, are all over the place. Anytime there is a disaster, Israel sends them. And uh, he wrote this, what I find to be uh, a monumental editorial. Um, it was the first time to my knowledge anyway, that um, uh, in, in a peer-reviewed journal of this stature, that uh, somebody mentioned that a, one of the criteria for triage was likelihood to have quality of life after, or likelihood to get rehabilitation. Uh, so in other words, they, and I think it's written here, um, there it is, yeah, the potential for rehab uh, was an additional con consideration during the triage process. This is uh, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, over here in this other part where I quote, where I quote them, uh, uh, you know, they believed it would be incorrect to use our limited resources to treat patients with such a minimal chance of ultimate rehabilitation. And he goes on in this to talk about how people with spinal cord injuries were triaged very low uh, and were not treated, they were turned away. And he received a lot of uh, flack for this. Uh, but again, these are the hard decisions that get uh, made in disaster and uh, ca catastrophic medicine. Uh, we are about to um, meet these fairly soon. And so uh, my last uh, point here, and then we'll pass it over to our guest, but the, the last point I'd like to make is um, I, I, I read through today the, um, the, the new uh, clinical practice recommendations uh, that were published. This is these are the ones that were, um, you know, endorsed by CPA and a whole bunch of the other um, associations around the world. And I tried to look for um, emergency disaster context, and um, I'm not sure it's it's fully there. Uh, and and that has no critique for the actual guidelines or the recommendations, and not at all. My only point is that um, issues that Ofer has brought up issues that White and Low have inter intervened on to create a, a framework, I'm not sure they're pres pres present here in these recommendations. So I, I only say this because in the next few weeks, for those of, of you, and I won't be, but those of you who are working in those high acuity levels of care, the guidelines have to be just a roadmap, um, not an ultimate roadmap, but just a, a series of paths that you might be able to take. Um, uh, I'll just kind of stop there and then say that on the other side of your screen, Rebecca here, I don't know if you follow her on Twitter, uh, but she is a, a respiratory physio there in the United Kingdom treating COVID-19 patients. And just today she started uh, tweeting out some of the complexities that she is facing. And I, I kind of retweeted her and I said, you know, keep the conversation going because those are the pieces that we need. It's, we need live feed of information for those in the field. Uh, because that can supplement the recommendations and vice versa. So, so I think that for those of the, uh, the, the PTs right in the thick of it all out there, mostly in, the, in Europe at this moment and in New York City, it's time to really get some information out there so that we can make the recommendation something of a really live breathing event. Uh, because if we think of it as a, as a static, here are the recommendations, I, I fear it will lead us down the wrong path in the next few weeks. Uh, Phil, I'm going to pass it back over to you and to introduce our guest, and that's our situation rep for today. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for uh, bringing up some of the recent literature and everything that's coming out, too. So just before we um, 
Before I introduce our guests, I'm going to bring up a couple things as well. But uh, just to so just looking through some of the um, the actions that organizations are making, as well as physiotherapists around the world. So I'll just touch briefly on this was one that was one of the initiatives that uh, Humanity and Inclusion is working on is really how to support and deliver rehabilitation and physiotherapy in some of their more complex situations around the world and where they're working. And then the other one that you might have seen is that Rachel, who we were on a, a talk with during the APTA um, Facebook Live or one of the sessions that they put out. So she, there's a physiotherapist at in the UK who's now the head of one of these COVID-19 hospitals that were developed. And there's a really good article where she talks about her role in terms of um, helping and assisting people that are on mechanical ventilation and the complexities around that. And also that she's taking a lead role in terms of that center, but also supporting and developing ones that are uh, being developed in the UK as well. So now um, just kind of bringing that up to show that there are people all over the country and all over the world who are kind of leaning in as physiotherapists and rehab professionals to support COVID-19. And our two guests today are really leaning in in Canada and they've really taken the initiative upon themselves to support their local community, support the local hospital so that together they can combat and help to really provide a service and decrease the burden that we've been talking about so much on the medical system during this pandemic. So I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick. So Patrick Cayenne is a graduate of the physiotherapy program at the University of Ottawa. He also holds an MBA from Queen's University. And he's also the owner and managing partner of Ottawa Valley Physiotherapy and Sports Medicine, which was established in 1997 and has four clinics throughout the Ottawa Valley. And you might recognize Patrick. He's been pretty active on our Cross Canada checkup sessions. And although he did have a beard a few days ago, but now that he's working in hospitals and acute care settings, he has to be able to put a, an N95 mask on. So now he's all clean shaven for us. So it was, it was a sacrifice, but we appreciate it. And then, so Patrick's going to start off, but then afterwards, we have Jen St. Michael, who's, uh, she's a graduate of the Masters of Physiotherapy program at McMaster University in 2005. And after she graduated, she worked at Cambridge Memorial Hospital, and she has experience in a lot of different areas, so ICU, emergency, oncology, palliative care, acute medicine, and surgery, as well as outpatient and private practice. So Jen has worked at Renfrew Victoria Hospital that she'll talk about today since 2011. And she's been a senior, physio, a senior physiotherapist there since 2013. And she has a special interest in cancer care, palliative care, and lymphedema treatment. So I'd like to welcome both of you and we'll, I'll pass over to Patrick to kick it off and let us know about the initiative. How we doing there? Oh, we lost Patrick. Uh oh. Okay. All right, Jen, there you go. Some technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll pass it. Maybe Jen, are you okay to share a little bit and then we'll get Patrick on when he gets back on? Absolutely. Um, so I can speak sort of from the beginning of where I stepped into this relationship. Uh, so Renfrew, uh, the Renfrew Hospital, I'll just start off by saying we're in a unique position because it is a small community hospital, 55 beds. And I will say that uh, we have a cordial working relationship with Patrick and his, um, his uh, staff. So that was really um, important in, uh, in, you know, the foundation of the relationship. Oh, we got Patrick back. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. So we'll, um, yeah, maybe Jim, we'll pause you there because I think it'll make more sense for everyone um, after Patrick kind of opens it up. 
That sound good? Yep. Okay, Patrick, you're up. You're back. Sorry about that. It's a good old reliable Valley internet that uh, you've just experienced. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, uh, at the, uh, the week of, of March break, uh, we went uh, from getting ready to leave on a nice little trip to basically uh, within a couple of days having to close down all four of our clinics to deal with um, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Um, and so that we, that first week we were trying to figure out what we do and where we were at with all of this. And, um, certainly I turned to Phil, uh, our expert and, um, you know, in discussing with him what was going to happen, it became very obvious that, um, things were not going to be the same and, and opening was, uh, our clinic was not in the near future for us. So, uh, after those discussions, we we figured out that there was a role for us to play uh, as physiotherapists, um, almost unemployed physiotherapists, because we were reduced, as everybody else was, to uh, urgent care and, and maybe a little bit of telehealth. Uh, so we thought, what can we do? Uh, we didn't want to be um, on the sidelines. We didn't want to be just watching the parade go by. Uh, we wanted to be proactive. Uh, so... We said, where, where can we apply our skills? And it was a natural fit to talk to the hospital uh, here in Renfrew and, and see if there was a fit. Um, one of our guiding principles has been um, <clears throat> when we look back on this, this pandemic, um, what do we want to look at? What, what do we want to be remembered at, as? Sorry. Um, and we have a great group of therapists, extremely well, uh, skilled, um, and we just wanted to figure out where we fit. So we sent a uh, proposal to the hospital to see if uh, there would be a role for us to play, uh, partly in the preparedness, um, trying to get patients out uh, into the community. Um, Jen and her team have done a wonderful job. So they're, they're, right now, it, it's not a great need, but the need is, is certainly coming. Um, once the uh, the pandemic uh, <clears throat> or the outbreak reaches us um, a little bit more vigorously and um, post um, COVID, um, is there still a role for us to play? So having a great relationship with the hospital that we've built over the years, uh, we decided that it would be uh, quite appropriate to approach them and um, and see if there was something that, that could be done. Um, and um, basically our proposal was to uh, initially uh, help taking patients out of the hospital um, and um, do whatever was necessary um, to get people out of there and, and also uh, help out in the emergency room uh, as uh, orthopedic cases came in um, and, and whatnot. So that's kind of where the idea came out and uh, that's what we sent to uh, to the hospital and we got a response uh, almost uh, immediately um, I think um, ironically enough we we sent the proposal out uh, to uh, initially to the chief of staff at the hospital um, uh, on the uh, very night that the um, Ministry of Health sent out a, a rostering uh, invitation and um, within a couple of days, um, Jen and I had already started talking about um, how we could do this. Um, and, and I know she'll speak a little bit more about how it went uh, on her side, but um, it went, um, in, in my estimation, very quickly. Um, we're, uh, we've already had um, training done at the hospital, uh, spent the morning there, had to shave, and was fitted with a, an N95 mask. Um, and right now, uh, we're ready to go and ready to work with them. Um, on our side, it's been a bit of a challenge because there's certainly uh, a lot for, for us to learn, but also uh, it's been a challenge because we also have to um, look after uh, our injured care in our, in our own clinics and, and look at our own uh, survival. So um, the last thing that I do want to say is that this has not just been me talking to Jen from our side. It's, it's definitely been our team of therapists of all um, a lot of them have, have jumped in with both feet and, and um, uh, have embraced this opportunity uh, to help the community. So maybe uh, Jan uh, can speak uh, to how it went on her side. 
Absolutely. So uh, to pick it up from, you know, getting this proposal, um, again, the nice thing about a small hospital is that uh, people are on a first name basis with each other. And so I know the chiefs of staff and I know the administration uh, uh, personnel. And so I got the proposal, uh, they forwarded it to me very quickly and I read through it and it took a night. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't ready for it uh, as being something that was necessary or being, or something that was uh, uh, even on my mind. But it took about one night's sleep uh, to realize that in fact, this is the ideal time to A, establish what the role of physiotherapy in our hospital is going to be to address uh, the pandemic, uh, to take a leadership role uh, within a fairly nursing-driven administration. Uh, and uh, I thought uh, because our administration is very uh, open and supportive, we went to them and made a case that um, in a hospital where you have three physiotherapists, if you have one go down, you've lost a third of your staff. And if you have two go out sick, you've lost two thirds of your staff. So it happens very quickly. Um, and so a minimal investment in early training when census is down and we have time to train people to jump in quickly is well worth um, any, you know, it's well, it was worth the cost uh, up front to prevent um, great expenditures later on. And so because uh, our administration is extremely uh, open, forward thinking, and they were really open to the proposal in general, they said, yes, absolutely, let's train as many people as possible. And in the base, best case scenario, we don't need to use them. And in the worst case scenario, we have a you know, contingent of staff who are willing to jump in and um, and address all of these potential uh, scenarios. Uh, there were some questions from HR, which um, may also, you know, in a bigger hospital, take longer to um, hire people and make offers and that sort of thing. And uh, in bigger organizations, there might be um, issues with the uh, with unions and um, how how that would play out in terms of hiring casual staff now um, but our admin is very much forward thinking and they are um, very supportive and and were very receptive to the role that they thought that physio could play um, not only to be physiotherapists but in emergency situations to play other roles that might be uh, appropriate for our level of uh, medical knowledge and training um, so there's lots of exploration too in the future coming about um, you know, depending on census and depending on the need uh, to divert um, patients from, from eMERGE, um, because Patrick also has a, a private clinic, not that we would exclusively direct patients there, but we can sort of um, make him aware of needs in the community that we're seeing and, and um, help, that, help people in the community to access services um, they may, might not be aware of. Uh, so we're really lucky because the administration in our hospital is um, open and receptive and we have a really good working relationship. So it went remarkably quickly, actually. And really, at this point, um, the, um, the onus has been on uh, really quickly trying to put together training because we are on electronic documentation, which is complicated um, and we are a small hospital with no ICU but it is acute care uh, so we do have kind of a broad scope of practice right now and so if you've been not in acute care for a, a little while it's it's a lot to take in there's a lot of rules and regulations that come with working in a hospital for health and safety reasons that people need to be made aware of but now is the time because we have time I, the census is low in the hospital. This is the time to dedicate to training people, getting packages together. And when you put the time into arranging this now, it's much easier in the future to um, hire on more staff, whether it's um, physiotherapists or any allied health or, or um, anyone else in the organization. Uh, we've very quickly gone from in-person training to online videos. We've done... Um, you know, we're doing the in-classroom uh, documentation training in a very 
condensed format. Uh, we've gone to doing um, other uh, online modules uh, that would normally be done in person. So the turnaround um, in the hospital on policy and procedure and how things are done still in a very safe way and it, it has been just amazing. And really that's where we are now. Maybe just and <clears throat> before we go to Phil and maybe questions, but just for context, uh, so Renfrew is uh, about an hour north west of Ottawa, a population of about 8,000 people. Um, I think, if I'm correct, Jen, the regional hospital, it's community hospital, but it's still regional, Pembroke, Renfrew, and then area. I think Patrick, you mentioned something really important to me the other day. Um, is that you know you had already had relationships with the hospital and with Jen, and, and you, yeah, fair enough, you can do that in the Ottawa Valley for sure. But but I think that's a lesson learned. Like the first time you meet with people and really start talking, shouldn't be the first time you want to suggest, hey, let's work together on a pandemic plan. So for for, for really the the main for me. Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people saying, well, how can we do that here? And, for, you know, just from a relationship building perspective, you know, I think that's really critical. And I think that's where physios into the future have to be thinking, who is my community? Now, who, who, who do we interact with? And, and, you know, can we be ready? And, and I think that was really, although it wasn't the emergency preparedness plan, that is actually step one in an emergency preparedness plan is like, who, what are your assets? Who are you? Who is your community? Who are you responsible for? So anyway, I just thought I'd make a little point before to, to put a little point on that and I'll pass it over to Phil. Yeah, that's definitely a good good point. And I, that's what I was gonna bring up too. And that really, um, I've been kind of communicating with people across the country who are trying to get initiatives going and in different capacities. I think this is one where first it's, it's really amazing because it was uh, two individuals who kind of well, saw the opportunity and figured out where they could help. But then on the other end of it was um, having a physiotherapist in a hospital that recognized that what was coming in was something of value and working together to make it happen. So I think it's it's really incredible on both sides to to um, you know present it, but then accept it because that's that's uh, that's another component of it. And I know a lot of people around the country that are trying to get things going likely didn't have that relationship before so when they do say present it to um, either ministers of health whatever the initiative is then uh, they kind of hit a lot of roadblocks so it kind of link it makes me think of something that pete skelton was talking about in one of our sessions where he talked about how a lot of the times in global health and especially in humanitarian crises you need the right people in the right places at the right time and everything that's been happening it just seems like all of those pieces were just just fit together and things are happening uh, really nicely so i'm going to um open it up to questions and just to let everyone know for these sessions on tuesday nights what you're going to do is it's a little bit different than the other sessions so you'll type in your questions in the there's a q a section at the bottom and then i'll read them out and then uh, the speakers will have a chance to respond While we're waiting, Phil, if, uh, if I may add, um, uh, one of the things that's been really great uh, in this relationship has been the fact that Jen uh, and, and, our, and her staff have recognized very quickly that this is not about private and public, uh, but rather um, about the role of physiotherapy and, and how important we are in this continuum. And um, uh, we were very much on the same wavelength when it came to saying, hey, this, let's make this work because we can be, you know, at the forefront of this. We can push our profession and, um, you know, maybe even inspire other, you know, other small or big communities to, to try their hand at doing this. Um, and we both feel that there is a, a huge opportunity on the table for physiotherapy and and there's a sense that if we don't jump on it and if we don't uh, take the bull by the horns that um, we may uh, end up on the losing end uh, 
uh, of this uh, th this fight that seems to be happening in healthcare, where you know everybody is starting to infringe and encroach on 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 other uh, traditional professions. Um, you know, as an example, how uh, years ago in ICU uh, there was no such thing as RTs, and now RTs have, have taken uh, a big part of uh, what respiratory physiotherapists used to do. Um, so we don't want to see that happening to our profession. We want to be there at the forefront, and we want to make sure that uh, at the end of this, uh, we're front and center in in, in fighting the uh, the upheaval that that this COVID nineteen is going to bring on patients. Uh, if I might add to that, Patrick, I must say, working in hospital, um, allied health is generally physiotherapy, you know, included. But allied health is generally a very small, uh, seen as a smaller stakeholder. In, uh, when compared to physicians and nursing. Uh, a lot of unit managers and uh, admin staff are from a nursing background or a medical background, and so it is generally difficult to get a seat at the table and have your voice heard. Uh, so again, we're very lucky in this organization that um, we've really, really uh, worked to build a strong relationship with nursing and the admin so that we have that seat at the table. Um, but I think it, that's important to have because if you don't have an ear, then yep. where are you going to get? So let, let me, thanks for that. Let, let me ask the question from Vivi Reese here. Um, can I ask what the compensation arrangements are for PTs like Patrick coming into the hospital? I know that there's likely no standard, but I'm wondering where it is in this example. Uh, so the, it is, in our hospital, the physios are part of the QP union. So it is a pre-established uh, pay scale. Um, I could give you the exact details if you like. Um, I think it ranges, you know, but it's a predetermined pay scale based on um, the QP union um, agreement. And so uh, at this time, everyone is getting um, sort of entrance level pay. If I can add to that, um, when we endeavored to do this, um, th that was not at the forefront. Um, we were certainly extremely happy when, you know, especially for the other physiotherapists on our team that, are, that have decided to join this effort, um, we were quite happy that there was uh, some compensation. Um, and, and um, you know, I think uh, some people were surprised. Um, so, again, I think it, 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 it speaks volume to um, the great job that Jen did and impressing upon uh, the management of the hospital that that was, that was a need that they needed to spend on um, as opposed to, a, you know, a volunteer service or a frivolity that, that they don't need. So um, kudos to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know, uh, yeah, I mean, I was even when Patrick and I were talking about this, we're both kind of surprised about that. And I think a lot of people are. So yeah, it is really amazing. Now there was another question here from Nicole who asked about the proposal. So she asked what was, what exactly was the proposal? Was it just using physical therapists for functional mobility or what was included in that? That's a good question. Well, so the proposal, um, you know, uh, I, I've been around the block long enough that if I submitted a 25-page proposal, it was going to be uh, put at the uh, at the bottom of the pile. So it was fairly short. Um, it was very to the point, um, but it had enough detail to describe what the role we could play in terms of uh, some of the things that you've mentioned, mobilizing patients and all that. But we we saw it as uh, go in. Do what our uh, do what we do best in getting people moving and getting people out of the hospitals because we're going to need beds um, and um, a, you know further that further to that was also um, dealing with uh, the on possible onslaught of um, the emergency room uh, for not necessarily for the COVID cases but if the doctors and and the nurses are busy with uh, those the the uh, non-ortho or non-directly uh, physiotherapy patients, then uh, we need to be there to uh, to support their effort for the, 
for uh, emergency cases. Um, and so that, that's pretty much what the, uh, the, propos the proposal uh, highlighted. Um, and I think it's probably important to know too that the, uh, the hospital itself is not a COVID-19 designated hospital. Um, so in light of that, we're, uh, and, and maybe Jen can speak more to that, but uh, the expectation is uh, expat patients and, and um, patients being moved out of centers where they, are, they do have to take COVID patients um, and, and we make room for them by taking those patients and, you know, hence the circle of life, getting them out of uh, our hospital to create rooms for other hospitals, I suppose. Let me, let me right, jump. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, I should have mentioned before that, uh, so Renfrew is a is not the regional center for um, COVID cases. So Ottawa and Pembroke would be um, admitting those patients, but there is a, um, so we've been told that we will be expected to take repatriations uh, from Ottawa and any other center out of our catchment that might require room or um, be at capacity. Uh, we are the regional center for dialysis patients, so we do have a very high volume of patients with acute uh, dialysis needs, which is sort of a special case. But um, so yeah, the um, I think in the end we may see that we do end up with some COVID-19 patients and that will happen if it happens, but the, the onus will be on um, rehabilitating people who have even either been through a COVID-19 situation or been critically ill elsewhere, um, getting them up and moving. Uh, I think that in the future, rehab, regional rehab beds will be full as well. So I think that the, um, the caseload and the scope of our practice in a small acute hospital will change dramatically um, in the coming months as well. So um, there'll be lots of room for people who uh, don't need ICU experience. Let me just jump, thank you for that. Let me just jump in. The two things that the two of you mentioned that are really related to principles of humanitarian response. Uh, the first one is everybody has to check their ego at the door. So if you're a nurse, a physician, a PT, basically whatever needs to be done, you, you manage it and it gets done. So, so this idea of, you know, only PTs, you know, we're only going to do this in a real emergency disaster that, um, that you do that once and you're out of the, you're off the ship. Uh, because we, you know, when all hands are on deck, you need to be working as a team, like a pit crew, really. Uh, so that's one. Um, so maybe just for everybody to be aware, and I'm sure that was part of what Patrick had mentioned, is that, you know, we're here to serve and you just let us know and we'll do it. And that's the right thing to do. It's not, um, you know, we have a, a guideline, so we'll implement that here. That's not going to, it's not what we need. So the second point they did mention that's really important is um, uh, really this idea that, um, well, anyway, I'll stop there. There might be some more questions. I just want to make an, a link between what you guys are just saying and humanitarian response principles. So thank you for making that. Yeah, good points, Mike. And any other questions from the uh, from the floor? You can type them in. I did see that there's a comment from BB that said uh, so she's sure that most or many PTs would be agreeable to working on a volunteer basis, but she likes the model that you've you're, that is happening. Um, rec the models that recognizes the need to be fairly compensated. So that is yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that for sure. Um, and then, so there was another question on uh, how many tests were being done in the area, but I don't know if that would be something that you could uh, answer or if you'd have any information on. I can tell you that the public health, Renfrew County Public Health positive cases um, are currently at nine. Uh, so very low uh, numbers currently. Okay, and while, while people are thinking of another question, something that's really come up to add on to what Mike was saying too is it almost seems like, and the more you're talking about this, what's happening at the hospital, it almost seems like it's a, almost serving as a like transitional care facility. 
where people, so not only are we trying to get people out of other hospitals that can be designated as COVID-19. So the, if there is that surge in, <clears throat> in patients that we're expecting, then really what there could be an increase a demand for rehabilitation at the hospital and in for itself. So having physiotherapists and rehab professionals available seems like a, a really good idea. And then the other thing you mentioned too, which is that happens in disaster type situations and humanitarian crises is having these transitional rehab facilities where people can go like once they leave hospitals. And it's a, exactly what you were saying. A lot of it is to allow a more efficient flow through the entire system. So once people are, say they come out of one of the COVID-19 centers or hospitals, then they don't have to go to, if they're, from the, if they're from the Valley, they don't have to go to Ottawa or a large urban center to get, to receive rehabilitation. They can be sent to these facilities within the community. And then, I, you know, to add on to that, when we look at afterwards, one of the, like, the beautiful things about all this that I didn't really think about until right now, but even having a somebody who owns so many clinics within the community would also know of the resources that are available there. So then after people even leave those transitional facilities, they can be linked back into the community. So it's overall, the more that you're talking about it and the more that I think about it, it actually is just such a beautiful initiative. Uh, to that end, I agree. Um, the more we think about it, I mean, right now we're in the midst of let's train people. We're in an acute situation. Acuity is high. We're expecting uh, acute uh, patients to be hospitalized. Um, but once we get beyond that um, crux of sort of planning and panic, uh, there is the, the life that goes on for all of these patients after they leave the hospital um, and carry on with their lives. And there's still going to be quite a few restrictions in how they access rehabilitation and home care and outpatient services. So I think the next steps that we're going to be thinking of shortly will be how do we address um, people on the other end of this, uh, whether it's related to COVID or not, those people will be there and they will need um, services and, and rehabilitation um, to, to optimize their health once they've left hospital. Um, and how do we get to those people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The report came out, I'll just make one more point, just yeah. totally agree with that. Maybe there's two points. <laughs> Uh, one is when, when emergency disaster planning goes well, you don't hear about it because it, the plan worked, right? It's just all under, it's all working. And, but when, when you don't, so, so to just congratulate the lead around your, like Patrick for stepping in, Jen, you know, whoever is the CEO for, for taking advantage of this. And I think it's up to us and you to make it, work and then we report on how well that actually works so I, I think that's really critical um, so congratulations to the two of you on that thank you I might add I was Patrick's student so he did teach me everything I know <laughs> <laughs> well this is kind of funny because Jen was a, a student of mine a, a long well not that long ago and um, now it's it's my turn to uh, to be the student and uh, you know I uh, spent part of the day uh, this morning uh, shadowing Jen and, and her showing me uh, things that, uh, well, we're, we're below the surface, but I guess I still remember. So uh, it, it, was, uh, it, it was very interesting and very nice to see uh, a, a sort of a reversal of roles. <laughs> well, yeah. it goes to show that everyone's willing to put their egos aside and, and uh, work to their strengths and admit what they don't know and work together as a team. Um, so that is, as you said, Mike, uh, probably the crux of the whole of the whole agreement moving forward. A question comes in saying, do you think this type of proposal, do you think this type of proposal is feasible, is a feasible option for other small communities to implement? What advice would you give them to implement a similar project? And maybe I'll add this now, uh, like under these, like where we are today, April uh, 7th. Um, any advice? Um, 
I think uh, having a contact in the hospital, regardless of who it is, uh, you know, it's even better if it's if if it's in the physiotherapy department or if it, if it's in management. But use your contacts um, and and don't come out, uh, you know, uh, thumping your chest and and pretending that you have the issue uh, in hand and, and you know what to do. Uh, I think it's uh, from the private sector. I, I guess the pri uh, approaching hospitals. Um, I think the uh, um, the humanitarian approach um, to let them know that you're you want to be part of the solution um, that you don't want to be on the sidelines um, and like you said check your ego at the door and um, give them the opportunity to uh, to, to accept um, you know your your help uh, from my side um, I think that's probably uh, good advice uh to add to that, I would agree, and I would say do it sooner rather than later, because um, depending on where you are, uh, census is generally lower now uh, in hospitals, so this is the time to um, receive training, to make proposals, to uh, speak to people when they have time, because once we're in the, cr in the crunch of this, um, it's all boots on the ground, and, and time for those sorts of things has sort of passed. Uh, so if when everyone's in panic mode, it's much harder to think clearly and get people in in a safe and efficient way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the, um, we kind of keep coming back to this too. We say, you know, an emergency means now. And the sooner the better, and, and speed is of the essence. So it's, it's really um, it's impressive that even within a hospital, you've been able to manage that and uh, allow things to happen quickly when otherwise they wouldn't. So now there's a, another question that came in from Jenny. So she's, she's asking, so in terms of having a step down facility, what do we think our role is in terms of advocating for publicly funded COVID recovery once out of the hospital system? For example, in BC, anyone who gets a knee replacement is allocated 12 PT visits at the private clinic of their choosing. So, and then who is responsible for this training? And then, so I'm not aware of, any, of many Carter Rest PTs who work in private practice. So I guess, so a couple of questions. So what do we think our role is in terms of advocating for public funded COVID recovery? And then who's responsible for the training and kind of where we would find those individuals? Well, that's a good question. I can tell you, um, I today we reached out to the Ministry of Health um, just regarding some publicly funded. Um, so in Ontario, we have like bundled care service um, post op, and we have um, what's called an episode of care for lack of a better, better term, therefore um, people in a vulnerable sector. So um, people over 65 or under 19 or on a social assistance program. So we reached out uh, to see if the government would consider funding any of those people to receive uh, telephone or telehealth type uh, treatments um, that would be funded. Uh, and so we haven't heard back yet um, about that. Um, whose role is that? It to advocate I guess all of ours I don't know I'm not much of a mover and shaker so maybe that's a better question for you and for Bill and Mike well from my end I would I would agree with you that there's not a lot of uh, cardio rest uh, therapists or, or solely cardio rest therapists uh, out in private practice um, I, I just don't know once they're past the acute stage um, whether the requirement for uh, respiratory physio is going to be that far out of the uh, the, the the range of what is uh, let's say comfortable for even our, our so-called MSK uh, physiotherapist. I know that um, one of the things that, that we're going to be leaning on uh, Jen and her team is is to you know pass on some nuggets and and of knowledge and and um, you know help us out in that department. But I, I do think that our core competencies um, you know certainly uh, include uh, doing chest physiotherapy and and once. Uh, they be, they get into the recovery phase. Um, you know, I, I do think that um, it's not that far off uh, for other therapists that don't work in hospitals to to get to that level of care um, where patients are going to benefit greatly from those types of interventions. So, mm -hmm. 
But as far as funding goes, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of good points there. The well, I like Jen when you were saying like whose responsibility is it, and you said it's everyone's. And and then I mean you even said you're not a mover and shaker, but I'd say I think you are in terms of everything you've been doing and um, you know just and taking the initiative for this. But I, so I would, I totally agree that we all have a responsibility to advocate for this, um, especially if we're not recognizing unified voice, then we really should be taking it upon ourselves to do it. But then along with that, I think we do need that unified voice. And I continue to advocate for that, that we, within Canada, within our communities, as a profession, we should be advocating for a role, but also protecting our role, kind of like what, Patrick was getting at before too, because we do have a huge value within the healthcare system, but it's just a matter of how do we, um, how do we bring that forward? And there are structures that we can, that are available in Canada for us to have our voices heard at multiple levels. But I think what you're doing and afterwards, when this is all over, making sure that it doesn't stop there, that we also share these success stories and, and share the message that this is what we can do in acute care, this is what we can do in disaster response, and then bring that forward as a model. I see Mike is gonna jump in. I'll just, you see, Phil already knows, he just, he can feel it. So uh, I, my, my thought on that is, um, I agree, you know, but if we use models to solve problems that existed like in December of 2019, like that recent, they're going to be obsolete when we get through this. They, they really are. The, the models are going to change. This event has kicked us in the backside into the future if we choose to re-engineer ourselves. Um, I truly believe that there is no going back from here. Um, we, we could continue down as, as a profession down the path of allopathic allied, you know, allied to allopathic medicine, or um, we can choose a different road. And I think the only way we can choose is if we're kind of together. And that's why it's so important to be doing this uh, with CPA. It's very important to connect CPA with APTA and everyone. And if we had a global consortia of where we're all going to go from here, um, then we got a shot at it. If, if we use the hammer that was using before to hit the nail of the future that's going to change, I'm not so sure we're going to be successful. So it is time to really dig deep and think about where we're going to go. Vivi has a, a question here. I'll just read it. Uh, uh, I'm a home care PT, uh, totally a generalist, but I routinely have referrals for pulmonary rehab, COPD, lung, CA. I would anticipate that this will increase. There will be a question about what... Yes, there you go. Volume to quality and if you're doing low it's hard to get to that quality measure when you're doing low volume but uh but what vivi is talking about is um it's going to be everybody's responsibility maybe we create a new sector maybe a new profession out there who knows um phil do you want to read the anonymous uh, attendee and then uh, we can close it up yeah yeah so i'll read up the last question and we'll wrap it up after that so the this question is is the contract solely for his employees coming out in the hospital or also using the clinics for discharges from the hospital that may require rehab to prevent readmission or to expedite a discharge it was just mentioned it would be important for patrick to know what the needs are in the community and just wondering what you meant by this um so i guess as an employee of a public uh, health facility in Ontario, I can't uh, direct any patients or um, clients to a certain pra uh, private um, clinic. Um, you know, we can't recommend one over another. Um, however, I think, um, so, I'll probably get you to read the question again, but um, so what I meant in terms of letting Patrick and his uh, clinic know sort of what the needs were or if there were needs that were being unmet, um, just that um, if, you know, if, if there's a relationship there and we can say, you know, there are these people who are being discharged and there's nothing for them, um, 
not specifically patients, but these are the cases that we're seeing. Um, do you, you know, give them an opportunity to um, address those needs? Maybe you know, in the private sector, um, I think in in order to to support the community um, is a fair is fair game. So I maybe repeat the beginning part of that question. I might have missed it. Yeah, no, I think well, I I, I think you answered it right, uh, fully. So basically, it was just asking if if the contract was solely for his employees and then the process of discharge. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, so the the as it happens, um, we were um, presented with six employees who were willing to work and willing to be trained in short order. So um, those people were offered uh, six months sort of casual uh, contracts with the hospital. Uh, we weren't um, trying to exclude anyone else necessarily, but as it happened, we have recently put posted uh, positions looking for casual physios on an unrelated uh, um, issue, and so we felt that we knew what the um, what the market was like out in the community. And so when six people come to you and you've you know been searching and searching for physios, uh, you don't turn them down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I think that's great. And even your your points on having really services that are available in the community, understanding what the issues are, and and um, and just having a say someone who typically works in private practice work within a hospital, and then being able to see the entire continuum of care for those individuals, it will be a benefit for everyone, and not only for that specific clinic, but also for you know sharing those lessons learned from a private practice physiotherapist going to a hospital but then also having those patients come to him so i think it'll be good for everyone it's going to be good for um, the patients when they come out of the hospitals it'll be good for the communities and really good for uh, the teamwork as well i see patrick's going to make the point yeah i just I just wanted to add too that that part of um, uh, what Jen was talking about is also the fact that sometimes there's there's a frustration, um, whether it's from the public or the private uh, sector, where you want your patients to receive a certain uh, type of service, or you're looking to you can't fulfill something for your patients, and and uh, sometimes you just have to hit your head on the wall to figure it out and. I think with this kind of, of relationship that we have uh, and, and the teamwork that we're going to be uh, exhibiting, uh, I think it's going to be a lot easier for Jen to say, hey, this is not available. Uh, hey, Patrick, is this something you can do? Um, and I think that that's a big part of the, the relationship. Uh, we have an opportunity to learn from them just as much. Uh, I hope that they have an opportunity to uh, uh, to learn from us. And um, although this is not speaking to the exclusivity of our team by any means, but I know that what works well in this arrangement from our side is that we have we have a, a critical mass of people that are uh, interested in doing this, but at the same time, we also have a second part of our team who, uh, because of either a distance or, or uh, whatever condition, they, they can't necessarily be at the hospital to provide those services. But those are the people that have stepped in and, and are playing other roles within our clinics, and whether it's our urgent care or, or whatnot. So um, I, I think that that's a big part of, of why this is going to be successful is because there's, there's key players uh, within our team that are jumping in at that different phase of this, this offer. It may not be up front and right at the hospital, but it is somewhere in the continuum of what we can offer. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's incredible. And people are coming in from kind of all angles and supporting in whatever way they can. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there, but I just wanted to take another opportunity to thank you for well, coming to speak with us, but really for the work that you're doing and really for your leadership during this time. And we're all kind of looking to both of you as leaders in this pandemic, and I'm glad that we we're, were able to share it. So thanks again, and thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having us.